are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again today. Just like any other show, we have another special guest. We have the amazing story of Steve Wilson. He has an amazing book that I want you to go check out. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. You can get it on Amazon. It's Teetering on a Tightrope, My Bipolar Journey. And we're going to learn everything about Steve's story and what inspired him to write this book. So first and foremost, Steve, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. Real good. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you taking time being on. Kind of tell the audience what inspired you to start writing this book and get it published. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll tell them a little bit about me. I'm 74 years old, so I've got a lifetime of bipolar disorder. Uh, I'm married to the same lady for 50 years. I've got three daughters and two granddaughters. I'm retired and I'm living in Scottsdale, Arizona. Now, what prompted me to write this book is that uh, I went to my trauma therapist about three or four years ago. I've been, I've been good. Uh, I got all my medication, everything. I've been good from about 2000. So for the last 23 years, I've been good. But I had a few things I needed to get straight. So I went to this trauma therapist and she had me go over my entire lifetime from when I was eight, my first real memory, until uh, today, essentially. When we got done, she told me there's so much in this that I should write a book. So I had been a writer in the past in sports. So I decided to do it. And I did it for the reason of, one, getting closure myself, and two, hoping that people who suffer from mental health issues uh, would benefit from my story. Because when I started looking up uh, bipolar books, uh, I didn't see any that went chronologically through someone's life. So I decided I can do that. And that's what became of the book. And when you look back, when were you officially diagnosed going through bipolar and how did you deal with that at first? Well, I was diagnosed. Let, let's go back so I can give you the order of this. Um, In my early years, I was fine. Everything was going well. I was a normal kid. And then when I was nine years old, I was sexually abused at a movie theater. That changed everything. My first depressive episode started fairly soon after that. And... I was not diagnosed. There was this was 1958, so there was nowhere to go to get help. Uh, I decided not to tell anybody, and I didn't for 30 years. Um, the depression came fairly quickly after that, and it was terrible. Felt like I was worthless, like I wanted to die, like no one loved me. I had no friends, had no meaning in life. And it was like a roller coaster ride. In other words, that kind of stuff came for a month or so and then left for a couple of months or whatever. So I went through that uh, all through elementary school, junior high, high school, and college. And then when I graduated from college, it really got bad. And I. First got diagnosed in 1970 with clinical depression. And during the time I was first diagnosed, I was at my lowest. 
And I got in a fight with my father. And the next thing you know, I was institutionalized. That was 1970. One, I think. The diagnosis came right after that, and I was diagnosed with clinical depression. Uh, they started putting me on uh, medication regime. Uh, nothing worked. For the next six years, they tried what few medications there were, because there weren't very many. None of them worked. They all made me sick as hell. And then in 1978, my psychiatrist came in and says, you were misdiagnosed uh, after all these trials we've gone through. I now think you are um, bipolar. Well, hell, I'd never heard of bipolar. I didn't know what it was. But he said, we're going to try you on lithium, which seems to work for most people. And it worked very well for me. Now, when I say very well, I mean, it got me back about 50%. I still had a lot of uh, uh, conditions that were bad, but the real horrible ones were gone. And I've been diagnosed and used lithium until about 1995 when it was discovered that it ruined my kidney. So, but at least I was in fairly good shape. And that's how I became diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder. And what's interesting about your story is, is when you mentioned about those years going by without you uh, saying anything about some personal things that happened to you, how much did that affect being able to, I guess, help the, the, the medical professionals to help you navigate where you were and where you wanted to be? Well, to tell you the truth, what happened was I finally got up the guts to tell my uh, psychiatrist that I'd been sexually assaulted, and he ignored it. So that was in about 1985 or something like that. That was the first attempt I tried to tell anybody. I didn't tell my wife until 2015. So you can see how guarded... I was with my secret. Uh, so, and I completely wiped it out of my mind. I never thought about it. One of the reasons was I never visualized my attacker's face. Many people, when they're attacked, zoom in on the face of their attacker, and that bugs them for the, until they get help to get rid of that. But I didn't, so that didn't grab me very much. And um, so I never told anybody else except that psychiatrist about my sexual assault. When it comes to you working, because you're still working, you know, when it comes to certain periods of of years. How did you deal with just the normal daily routine whenever you had a bad episode or, you know, a situation where you were just like, okay, this is a tough day? How did you still push through to function and and work? Well, that was a sad part of my life because I couldn't keep a job. Now, one of my problems was with bipolar, there's a large chance that anger will play a big part in it. And I would get angry at most of my jobs and they'd last about six months. And then I'd either tell them to go to hell or I'd, they'd fire me or, or whatever. So working was very tough. The thing that saved me as far as working was that my family has been in the retail clothing business, had been in the retail clothing business for 60 years. So they let me work in that, and that solved that problem. Otherwise, never would have made a living. Outside of the professional help that you did seek out to, to receive, 
Was there an individual or a support team that helped you in your healing process? Yes, I had virtually no support at home. And one of the reasons was back when I got it, nobody was really knowledgeable about what it was. They thought I was lazy or or, uh, just trying to get a free ride or whatever. So nobody supported me a little bit from my mother. She's the one who figured out that I needed a psychiatrist and she got me the psychiatrist. In all of those first 10 or 15 years, my psychiatrist was my support group. And without him, I don't know where I'd be today. But he died, I think, in like 87. And it took a a bit of trauma to find out how to get uh, another psychiatrist who I would work with very well. And I did. And he then prescribed Paxil because I had a bunch of ruminations. Ruminations mean that your mind is out of control. And you think and think and think about the same damn thing all the time. And you can't get it out of your mind. And that's what I was doing uh, in about, all the time. And he prescribed Paxil. And that's what got me back with the lithium on the right track. And I've been good ever since. As I said, he gave it to me in about 2000. Listen, I'll be focused radio talking to our guest for today. And Steve Wilson, you can get his book, Teetering on the Tightrope, My Bipolar Journey. You can get it on uh, Amazon and you can get it in Barnes and Noble and any other places that are available with that book title. That title is pretty, I mean, when you listen to your story and you read this title, it's very fitting. And how did you uh, end up finalizing the name of your book? Uh, we started out with the title being BP, Bipolar, and Me. But as we got going, we realized there was blood pressure in me, British Petroleum in me, and no one would know what it meant. So my wife and I and my daughter were discussing it, and we came up with two scenarios, tightrope or roller coaster ride. And we just ended up with the tightrope, and that was my wife's idea. And then I did all the writing on it, and uh, that's how it came about. Because one of the things you've got to understand about uh, bipolar is that it is like being on a tightrope. You're one time going to fall, the next time you're going to be up, and it just goes back and forth all the time. You never know when it's going to strike. And so what we all strive for is balance somewhere in the middle, sometimes where we can be normal again and uh, enjoy life to its fullest. Someone who could be listening to this episode right now, maybe they know a person that deals with this or they themselves deal with this. Outside of seeking professional help, what's some advice that you can give generally to someone who needs that encouragement to not just stick with the healing process, but to stick with the professional help that they receive? Well, as far as I'm, I do two mental health support groups in Phoenix a week. And I feel that there's about three kinds of people who have mental illness that come to my groups. First group is the one that seeks medical help and medication. They stay on the regimen and don't give in to giving up their pills or anything else, and they do as well as they can. The second group is the ones who will seek professional help, get medication, and then if it doesn't work right away, they stop taking it. Now, 
there are many of those who the medication works for, and they think, well, hell, I don't need this medication anymore. I'll stop it. And then they, after a week or so, they go back down in the toilet. And the third group is the group who will not seek help, will not take medication. And in my mind, many of them instead go to mental health support groups where there's no professional. And that's when they come to my group. And I find, sadly, that even if they have taken support from a psychiatrist or a psychologist and they're taking pills, that many of them started on their path to dealing with mental illness because they were abused when they were young, beaten, mentally abused, sexually abused. And just like me, it takes a hell of a toll. I want to tell you one thing, the medications that they have on the market, and thank thank goodness they're doing new ones all the time. But as of now, only about 50% of the patients get real relief from the medication. So they have to go to other sources, and there are several of them. First of all, we have tools to deal with our anxiety, such as tapping, uh, spinners, where you can just keep spinning this little wheel and it relieves your your anxiety. Um, you can do uh, dialectic behavioral therapy. You can do uh, intensive outpatient therapy. You can do eye movement therapy. Some people are now doing ketamine. Um, I've had some people get some good luck with that. It's not permanent. Maybe once a month or every couple months. And it's an infusion process. But for some people, it works pretty well. It's very expensive. And that's another problem we have in this country, that the insurance has ruined the mental health uh, ability to cover the costs and give good therapy to many people, especially those who uh, don't make a lot of money or seems to be proportionate to black people. They don't get uh, the help they should. But saying that, they don't come for the help as much as they should because they are they think, what the hell, no one's going to help a black man. So that's really horrific. And if you go to a private clinic, say you're on SMI means severely mental, mentally ill, and people are diagnosed with that, and then they can get clinics to help them at no cost. Problem is... The clinics are overwhelmed. When when I was first diagnosed, I went three times a week for months to get help. And I had insurance and it covered a lot of it. And back then it was $10 a visit. But today, if you go to a clinic, many of them say, well, I'll get you in right away. And that helps. But then you go to schedule another appointment, they say, we'll see you in three months. Or the clinic is not allowed to uh, prescribe the newest medications because they're too expensive. So all these people fall through the cracks. Housing for them takes at least a year to get sometimes two and three years. So it's not a good system. The insurance companies are to blame. They've cut how much they give to the medical profession. So many of them are forced to charge fairly high visits and not take insurance. Yeah. 
that's that's an exclusive insight and uh from your personal experience what would you say to someone who might be going through that right now uh dealing with that what could they do today to find resources that will make this uh a less stressful process well of course there are people who are going through this who have the resources to get help it's their decision if they want to find help good help is out there a lot of great things can be done for them and just like me I had the resources to get good help, and it took 30 years, and I got my life back, and I had a decent life uh, after 1978 until 2000. So I was able to function real well. And it is my opinion that if people really want to get well and they follow the regimen and they get a psychiatrist uh, and a therapist, after a long battle, they can beat this thing. Now, for those who fall through the cracks and can't afford help, uh, groups like mine are excellent because they'll find out that they're not alone. They'll get tips on what to do and how to survive. And it's just great for them. My sessions run twice a week, Tuesday and Thursday night at 7. And you can find them through a uh, a group called COPA, C-O-P-A. But that's only going to help you if you're in Arizona. You can use my group, but they're always pretty full and the maximum I can handle in a meeting is about 15. I've had 20 and 25 before, but I just can't can't get through it. So there's groups all over the country, many groups. Some of them cost something. Mine doesn't cost a dime. And that's a great place to start because you'll get information that you never would have gotten because the people you're surrounded with aren't going through what you're what you're going through. Um, there are if if I were starting out looking again, I would probably go on the internet and look up NAMI, N A M I, uh, National Alliance of Mental Illness, and. Uh, maybe uh, Mental Health America, and get in touch with them, and they can give you all the information for what's available in your area. Uh, NAMI is a wonderful group, and most people don't know it. So we've got to get the word out for them. I appreciate you doing that. And once again, we've been talking to our guest today, Steve Wilson. You can go get his book, Teetering on a Type Road, My Bipolar Journey. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for sharing your story with our audience. Hopefully, it will inspire someone who either knows someone going through bipolar or someone who themselves are going through bipolar, that they'll go seek out professional help. And like you said earlier, see what's out there locally maybe there's some groups out there that they can be a part of but the point is you can go seek out and and get yourself on the on the right path for your recovering process so thank you for your time and appreciate thank you very you. much i enjoyed it <laughs>